Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21, here we go. When Jesus had again crossed over by a boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years and suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she just grew worse. But when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. So he turned around. Three words I want you to remember. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Amen. This, uh, this message is called Uncommon Healing. If you need a miracle, you're in the right place today. God, we love you, and we just invite your presence in this place to have your way. We shut out distraction, and we get truly present. Speak to us. We're listening. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen, amen. If you do have room, scoot in and take a seat. Uncommon healing. Really today, I kind of just want to share a story with you. I told a story at our men's conference a few months back, and it was just part of a story, but I've gotten so much feedback from it that I wanted to share the whole thing with the entire church and preach today about uncommon healing. Because um, last year, 2023, was a big year of transformation and change for me. Early on in the year, I, uh, I, I, I kind of like closed a chapter of my life that I had been rereading one too many times. But I kind of had this intermission period that was extended in between the last chapter and then turning the page into the next chapter and kind of just felt stuck. And I feel like there might be a lot of people in here where you are rereading the same chapter of your life again this year and is tired. And you have it memorized by this point, and it's time to turn the page. And I was gifted this incredible opportunity to, um, to go to this site in Southern California and do four days of one-on-one intensive counseling. And it was right outside San Diego, and uh, you show up and you turn in your phone, and there's no laptops or Apple watches. You don't have music for four days, you guys. For the first 48 hours, it was seriously withdrawals. Imagine getting back to your bedroom at night and it's just you in the room and the biggest dopamine hit that you got available to you is scripture. Like you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't got a podcast to put you back to sleep. It's just you and yourself and the big man upstairs. And, uh, and it was healing for me in so many ways. There were three other people there doing what I was doing. And each of the four of us got paired up with a counselor that we would spend the next four days with. And the counselor I got paired up with, her name is Janet. And how do I describe Janet to you? She is maybe the coolest lady I have ever met in my life. If you've ever seen the movie Parent Trap, Chessie, the housekeeper slash nanny, just like the warmest smile and spirit about her, that, that, was, that was Janet. And we sat down the very first morning, and she had gotten my questionnaire that I filled out like a month before, and and she started just tearing up right away. And she said, I want you to know I've been praying for you, and I have done this for a long time, and I have never been this confident in what God wants to say to somebody as I am right now with you. And right away, I'm like, 
Oh, it's about to go down. Okay, buckle up. Something's about to happen. And the first thing Janet does is she hands me a bag of rocks. And she says, uh, I want you to carry this with you everywhere you go for the next four days. And when she means everywhere, I mean when I got up to pee in the middle of the night, this bag came with me. And when I went on a run every morning, this came with me. And I, uh, if I took a shower, this was outside the curtain. I was holding it. This was with me everywhere that I went. And she told me, she said, your, your, your soul is heavy. And, and your, your spirit is weighed down by fear and battles you're fighting and habits and anxieties. And she said, tonight, this was the first night, she said, I want you to spend some time with God and pull out these rocks one by one. And on each rock, I want you to write a different battle you're fighting. I want you to write a different weight that, is, that you're holding, a different fear that you have. And, um, and so I did, and I carried it with me for four days. And it was a very tiring four days. And the final evening, we, uh, we went for a hike, me and Janet, up the mountain right behind the building we stayed in. We got halfway up. And we came to this sort of scenic overlook, and it was sunset, and, and that's when she said, you can drop the bag. And she said, I want you to pull out each rock one at a time, and I want you to listen to your soul tell you what you should do with it. And you guys know, man, I'm a pastor, so I'm like, I kind of knew where you were going to go with this, you know. And uh, so I'm, I'm pulling out rocks, and I think the first one was like anxiety, and so I just I throw it, right, as far as I can down the, down the mountain. And anxiety, be gone in Jesus' name. And then I pull out, you know, like sexual temptation and just throw it as far as I can, and you can hear the rocks crack on the boulders in the river and echo through the canyon so far below. But then all of a sudden, I reached in the bag and I pulled out a specific fear. I realized I should have made these red. These rocks, you know what I mean? It would have been too on the nose, though. This message still rocks, though, don't worry. But I, uh, that was so bad. Or brilliant, I don't know, one of the two. Okay, this is about to get really real really fast. I, um, th this specific fear was um, the fear of losing my five-year-old son. Um, he just, uh, he means so much to me. And um, that's why I always feel like I've given him like 80% of me, but I have this irrational fear as soon as I give you 100% of my heart, like this, this fear God's going to take him from me. And um, so I, I get ready just to like throw this thing as far as I can. But then Janet says, hey, what are you doing? And I turn around and I'm like, well, I'm, this is a fear. I'm throwing it. She said, no, I get throwing the fear. But she said, but that one's precious. She said, don't throw that. She said, listen, what do you want to do with it? And I turn around, and um, where the mountain started to go up again, right by the trail, there was this uh, beautiful young tree that just felt like it was around five years old. And I um, just felt like I was supposed to just place it right there next to the tree in the dirt on the side of this mountain, almost as an offering to God. Dedicating my son to the Lord. The spiritual gift, the spiritual discipline of dedication. I, I wonder what is in your life that you, you is so precious to you, you cherish it so much that you actually don't fully enjoy it because you're so afraid of losing it. So you grip it tightly and you end up controlling it. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a, a child or a parent or a relationship, maybe it's a, a company you started. Maybe it's a dream that you have or a goal you've been working towards. Maybe it's a position that you're now in and you, all your life, you just wanted the position you're in right now, but now you got it. And before you have anything, you got nothing to lose. But now that you have something, you, you have something to lose. And so the temptation is to control it and to grip it with all you got. But as long as you are controlling, you are actually not enjoying. You cannot love something that you are controlling. 
Even guys with this church, six years ago when we're a church plant, we literally have nothing to lose. So let's go for it. We don't have, we, there's no people, there's no money, we got no food, no jobs, our pets' heads are falling off, there's no building. And so what do you do? You risk by faith. And you take great leaps of faith and you, you build and you pray big prayers. But then fast forward six years and all of a sudden we have something to lose. All of a sudden there's like upwards of 3,000 people showing up on a weekend. And when you get to that place, all of a sudden now you're tempted to play it safe. And shift from offense to defense and hold on to what you have. And stop risking and play it safe and control the outcome. And that's the day a church gets old. I wonder what it is for you that you need to dedicate. Because after all, it's God's before it's ours. I think of Hannah in 1 Samuel. Um, all she wanted was to have a child, and she couldn't. And one morning at the temple, she was pleading with God. She said, if you allow me the gift of having a child, I will dedicate him to you. And the story goes, she gets pregnant, and then nine months later gives birth to Samuel. Hence, First and Second Samuel, that's where that comes from. And just in that moment when she is the most tempted to hold on to what is most precious to her, she dedicates him to the Lord. And um, I placed that right by the tree as a dedication. It was almost like God is my heavenly father speaking to my heart saying, hey, buddy, bad things happen in this world all the time. And you can't always control it and you don't always know. He said, but what you do know is my character because it never changes. And I'm good. And... I actually love your son more than you do, believe it or not. And I have better plans for him than you do, believe it or not. And he's mine before he's yours. In fact, he's on loan to you. And while he's on loan to you, if you will simply open your hands and continually give him to me, it will free you up to raise a man after my own heart and fully love him as much as you can and actually enjoy getting to be his dad. I wonder... What do you need to dedicate? Maybe a dream, maybe a company that you started and now you're, you're afraid of, because uh, uh, now you've got something to lose, right? Or a family or, or even a financial situation. What is, what is tithing if not dedication of your financial situation to God? Hey, you worry about it. This is yours before it's mine. You open up your hands and now you're free to, to enjoy something. You cannot fully love what you're controlling. And that's where dedication comes in as a very underrated spiritual discipline. And I just kind of sat that right next to the tree. And um, all of a sudden I feel, okay, something's happening right now. Um, starting to feel a little lighter. And I pull out the next rock. And, um, and this one says passivity. And I, uh, a few months ago I read in a Harvard Journal study about something they're calling the quiet quit. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but here's what the quiet quit is. Let's say at your job right now, uh, you feel unseen and undervalued and, and unappreciated. Well, instead of walking into your boss's office and having that confrontational conversation about a raise, or even instead of quitting face-to-face -to, -face to your boss. You know, like that Michael Scott moment where he walks out of David Wallace's office? You have no idea how high I can fly. And it's like that epic moment where it's a clear closing of a chapter and the start of something new. We don't do any of that anymore. Now what we do is the quiet quit, where you, you stay, but you quit. And you keep showing up, but not really. You hide in the org chart because you get a paycheck, and you quiet quit. And the cost is your passion, and what you start to reap is passivity. And passivity is something all of us, I think, to a degree struggle with because it's really just a quiet anger. All of us are angry because on a deeper level, all of us are sad, and we're angry about what we're sad about. And some of us express anger by blowing up, and the world's going to know if we're angry, and then you become the bad guy. But passivity is, is deceiving because you can be quietly angry, quietly angry, 
and quietly quit. I wonder, have you quiet quit something? Have you quiet quit on church? And not you, obviously, because you guys are here, but how easy is it to start just like, man, it's so convenient to just online, and then before you know it, it's like twice a month I'm tuning in online, but kind of. And then like six times a, a year, I'm tuning in online. And then are you quiet quitting on your relationship with God? Because you know he's constant even though you're not. And he's not going anywhere. So you kind of stop pursuing him. And, and your family and those closest to you would have no idea secretly in your heart how actually close you are to being an atheist. You just quiet quit a while ago. I feel like people quiet quit on marriages all the time. And you stay, but you quit. And you show up, but not really. And um, that, that for me, honestly, me and Sam talk about this all the time because our greatest danger, I really believe this, because I know Sam's not going anywhere. And I know that about me. Hey, I am not going anywhere. We, we are, there's no exit doors. We're in this together. But our greatest threat and our greatest danger is that for the rest of our lives, we will maybe start to quiet quit on passion and we will just be fine. Maybe a lot of marriages are in danger of, you're just fine, and good is the greatest enemy of great, and you become business partners raising kids, but you quiet quit on dating, and you quiet quit on pursuing each other, and you quiet quit on love, and you, you quietly, and it's almost easier, is it not to like leave, like not easier, I'm sorry, harder, it's easier to stay, harder to like walk out. And like, like the, the divorce or leave your family because then you become the bad guy to everybody in your circle. But if you stay and just quiet quit, nobody really knows that you've quietly quit. It's passivity. It's passivity. And the cost is your passion. And you start to pay a price whether you realize it or not. And the remedy for it is serving. Serve your wife. Serve your husband. Well, it's not working. I'm getting nothing in return. What does that have to do with it? Serve each other. And eventually, it'll turn into a competition where you try to outdo each other in honor. Serve your church. Serve your city. Serve your parents. Serve your friend circle. Serve your group. And watch as passion starts to creep back in your life again. Remember Jesus just hours before he's going to be arrested, knowing he's about to go to the cross having the final supper with his best friends, with the disciples. And he starts serving them by washing their feet. Meanwhile, all of them are arguing about who the greatest in the room is. And slowly but surely, as everybody starts to shut up and realize what's happening, do you think there is any hesitation or doubt in anybody's mind who the leader in the room is? It's the guy on the dirt with the towel in his hand, washing his friend's feet, including Judas, and serving. Serving is the remedy for passivity. Because go, if it goes undealt with long enough, what it turns into, and I have found this out, is bitterness. It's just quiet anger that you bottle up, and before you know it, you are, and I realize this, standing on the side of that mountain, I always thought, I'm not a grudge holder kind of person. Because I don't have any like massive grudges. I realize, man, I, I'm harboring a little bit of resentment here and a little bit of bitterness here. And you know, you know what I learned as a pastor over the last 15 years? Um, the hardest kind of person to pastor is a bitter person. Grieving people, you, I, I heard Erwin McManus say this, you just, you just sit with them. Um, stuck people, you just give them some tools to get you unstuck. Discouraged people, you just encourage them. But bitter people, I have found, actually don't want to not be bitter. Because, man, you earned your bitterness. You paid for it with a lot of pain that, by the way, they decided you would feel. Man, this rock, I earned this rock. I own it. No, that's the deceitful trick. You'll never own it. You will only ever lease it. You will pay for it every day without owning it. And bitterness, once again, I heard Irwin say, it's that you can't contain it. You, you can't contain bitterness just to one person who hurts you. That's what's so sinister about it. You've heard the quote like bitterness is you drinking the poison you want them to drink. 
but they're not. You are. It's imprisoning you, and you can't contain it to the one person. Like a cancer, it will start to take over every cell in your body until before you know it, you're just easily offended by everything. And it's like the universe and God is almost conspiring against you. And you take even like traffic on the highway. It's personal to you now. I'm just bitter about this and I'm bitter about that. And how did that happen? Because this just, it takes over. And the only remedy for it is doing the most unfair thing there is to do. Forgive. And I know some of you are looking at me like I just said the real F word in church. And I understand that, like, man, you don't even know, pastor. And you're right, you know what, I don't, and you don't know me. But here's what I do know about forgiveness. It's not excusing, and it's not even always trusting in the end. It's freedom for you. It's healing. It's releasing. It's you're trying to close a chapter in your life, but you can't quite turn the page and you don't know. It's, it's like heaven's uh, security checkpoint, like at the airport where you try to sneak a Gatorade or maybe you have like a full toothpaste and they're like, that can't come. You got to throw that away. I feel like that's what God does when he's going, you want the next chapter? You want my better plans? Where I want to take you, this can't come. And you can, you can hold on to it if you want, but you stay in here another year. I've been challenging you guys, man. You, you don't have to be reading the same chapter again next October. The same prayer request that you have today that you also had last year, you don't have to have a year from now. The generational curses your parents passed on to you, you don't have to pass it on to your kids. Freedom is here. Healing is here. But you got to go for it. I mean, Jairus, his daughter was sick, but he showed up looking for Jesus. This woman bleeding for 12 years, but she, she went for it, did, did she not? Like something supernatural took place and only God could do that, but you got to want it. You got to go for it. I'm telling you, there are miracles here for the taking if you want them. But sometimes you got to do the most unfair thing there is to do. You got to forgive. Boil the scriptures down to one word and it's not love, it's forgiveness. Because at its highest level, forgiving is what love does. I mean, there's no greater level of living for a human being than to forgive. And it's unfair. But I feel like it's an opportunity for you to feel more intimacy with Jesus than any other moment in your life. When you extend forgiveness to somebody who doesn't deserve it or didn't even ask for it. Forgiveness happens to be the only possible way, the only way to keep the bad things that happen to you from writing the story that is your life. That's it. You're hurt, you're in pain. Which medication are you choosing, forgiveness or bitterness? Bitterness is like morphine. It numbs you. You kind of get that bitterness buzz, which is why forgiveness feels a lot like withdrawals but it poisons you over time. Forgiveness or bitterness. Think of Jesus on the cross, literally praying for the 22-year-old Roman soldier driving a nine-inch nail through his wrist into a piece of wood. Father, forgive him. This is so much more about him than it is me. He doesn't know what he's doing. Without forgiveness, the trajectory is to get to the end of your life and have a very hard heart that kind of just doesn't like people and very thin skin that is offended by everything. Forgiveness is only on purpose and it's the closest thing there is to being invincible. And uh, I threw this and I'm starting to feel just like lighter and lighter and lighter and then I pull out um, the future. I actually kind of sum this up because I have a lot of worries about the future. And I have found that that really worries about the future, anxiety, it's just your soul's way of, of, of telling you it's time to pray. Because you can turn worries into prayers. And with this one, I found myself over and over again, all my fears about the future, turning around and actually throwing it up the mountain as a prayer to God. The future is in your hands. 
Today, I will choose with my free will as best as I can. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it this way so we can all kind of come up for air just for a second. But this little girl right here was my travel buddy last month on my preaching trip to Denver. That is, that's Kinsley, the cutest plus one in the history of plus ones, man. And uh, I love her so much. I love, I love little kids. It's refreshing to me how easy it is to impress little kids. Because to that little girl, everything on this trip was awesome. Everything was awesome. We stayed at the Comfort Suites, had a 45-inch TV in our room. She couldn't get over it. I'm like, Kins, we have a 65-inch TV at home. Didn't matter. She's like, this is, cool. this is incredible. Like, buttons to push in the elevator might as well have been Disney World. A cereal bar? Something called a continental breakfast? Are you kidding me? Not a national breakfast, church. A continental breakfast, man. Bagels from so many continents. <laughs> and uh, even in our room, we had two queen beds, and I... Um, I said, you can pick which bed you want, and uh, I, I recorded her choosing process. It's the cutest video I've ever seen, and I want to share it with you, so watch this. Which one's yours? Okay, which one's daddy's? All right. <laughs> There's about 12 sermon illustrations in there that I have found so far. Here's just one that has nothing to do with this message. It's like when you ask God what he thinks you should do, but you already know what you want to do, and you've already decided. So even though he's speaking to you, you're not hearing him because you're only listening for what you want him to say. That's for free. But here's another one. How we let fate determine our futures. And fate is a terrible author for your life. Terrible author. A lot of us do this with our eternities, I found. We kind of just cross our fingers and hope that we can be a good enough person to go to heaven and not hell. Which one is it? Well, it depends. If I, if I die, you know, on Sunday morning after church, I'm probably okay. If I die on Friday night, well, we'll see. <laughs> depends on the Friday night. And we eeny, meeny, miny, mo our eternities when the good news of the gospel is so much greater than that. That love is a choice. And heaven is something you can choose today. And the future, specifically your eternal future, becomes something that doesn't keep you awake at night, but now gives you hope and confidence. And you step into the future Knowing the tension between two things is more true than you ever thought. That God is sovereign and in control. And that he has decided to give you the free will to choose. To choose. To choose. Man, what a gift to be able to decide. For there is nothing more spiritual oftentimes than to simply make a decision. Knowing that, man, God's saying, I'll go with you. And I'm really good at getting you where I want you to go. But you must decide. Bitterness, are you going to forgive and let's go into the good plans? Or are you staying here? And if you listen long enough, man, there's something in you that knows. I know deep down the answer to this question. You know, Eric, uh, one of my good friends who runs kids across the hallway, um, is coming up on 11 years of sobriety in January. He is one of the godliest, most humble men that I know. And, uh, and so free in a five-year struggle with alcohol. And he said, man, you can, you kind of have a choice once again. You don't any, like you can choose. He said that trauma, you, you, your choice. Trauma for people I have found is either a trophy or it's a testimony. Depending on if you're going to heal or not or forgive or not. Or, and what Eric said, he said, man, I have, I have chosen over the last decade to forge a sword that is now my superpower. He said, man, all the regret and all the bad decisions and the people I let down and, and myself who I let down, I have put that all into forging a sword that is not a trophy. It is my testimony, and it allows me to lead other people who are in that same prison out the front door of that prison into more freedom than they ever thought possible. You have so much more free will in you than you realize to simply decide, to simply choose. Choose. Healing is there. 
Do you want it? A miracle is there. Are you going to go get it? That woman showed up choosing to sneak up from behind Jesus and grab the hem of his robe. And so I just threw this like up the mountain, all of my worries and fears about the future. And the next one I pulled out was addiction. And this was the one I was waiting for because specifically it said Vicodin. And a lot of you guys know my story, but early last year in 2023, I, uh, I finally walked away from a 10-year battle. For the last 15 years, I've had chronic pain. And then about 11 years ago, I was uh, given Vicodin for it for the very first time. And it worked. But it also worked for a lot of other stuff. It helped me numb a lot of the things I didn't want to feel. It was, and it, it was never like a, this full-blown addiction that I'm like, this is going to destroy me tomorrow. But it was this quiet killer. It's like this orange maraca in my backpack. That was like a friend I took with me everywhere I went. Became my crutch, became the thing I ran to and the place I would hide. And I justified it because I'm like, well, it helps with the pain. And, you know, doctors gave it to me, even though I know this is my, this is my vice. And I would get excited about headaches because I could run to my drug of choice. And uh, in January of 2023... We did a, a series called The Future You, and there was like a revelation I had where I realized 10 years from now, if I keep doing this, I am not going to like the man that I become. And the future me will thank the present me if today I can walk away from this thing. And uh, I did that in March, and I was kind of in this intermission, as I was telling you. That chapter was done. I don't quite fully know how to start the next chapter. And, and that's where I found myself at this, at this site outside of San Diego. And now I'm on top of this mountain throwing rocks in a, in a canvas bag off the side of a cliff. And I pulled out Vicodin, and I thought, man, I would have thrown this one as far as I could. Like my shoulder would pop, like my arm would pop out of the socket, and I would just get this the heck away. Away from me. And you want to know something about addiction is when you start battling it, you should flee from it. Man, you got to get in the ring. You got to fight. You have a battle in front of you and it takes you putting your gloves on. How many of us have a fight that we're in? We're just not fighting. Maybe you've been battling an addiction or a temptation and you failed so many times that you're just so exhausted. So you quiet quit on quitting because if you don't try, you don't have to live tired. And then I'm telling you, there is freedom here for you. And there's two battles at play. One of them is yours. There are things you can control. There's a rehab you can check yourself into. There, there's, there's software you can put on all of your devices if pornography is your thing. There's, there's a number you can delete from your phone. There's apps you can delete and get rid of. There's, you don't have to go to that bar. You, you can cancel that prescription from your pharmacy. There's a battle. There's things you can do. This is why Paul says, even 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, he says, man, flee from, he's talking specifically sexual immorality. He's saying flee from it. Take that rock and throw it as far as you can. I used to read that and roll my eyes thinking it's dramatic. Flee? Like Paul, come on. Do not call wisdom legalism to your own peril. He's saying that thing is a pet that you think is tamed, but it's an apex predator that grows up into a fully grown lion, and eventually it will do what it does best, which is destroy you. You don't flirt with it. You don't keep it as a pet. You flee. You throw this. You get in that ring, and you battle because the other fight that's happening is the supernatural one that the gospel does, where grace comes in and murders shame and destroys addiction. Little by little, you start to go from being a sober slave who's battling to all of a sudden turning towards something that is so much greater, a God who loves you so much more, the life that is truly life and the good plans he has for you until slowly but surely, freedom actually starts to feel like it. 
And I, I found out in that moment because six months earlier, I walked away from this and I threw it as far as I can. I still remember sitting in the parking lot outside of the Target pharmacy that I always went to and deciding to, to drive away and just and, and charge the storm and feel the withdrawals, knowing the future me will say thank you one day. And you got a battle, man, and that's not for the faint of heart. But I realized six months later, I pulled out Vicodin, and I'm about to throw it. And then all of a sudden, I realized what it means to go from conqueror to what Paul calls more than a conqueror. And I just reached out my hand, and I just dropped it. And um, it was almost like the farther you throw it, you kind of assign power to it because you know that thing owns me, so get away from me. In that moment, I realized I no longer have to. You would have put an orange bottle in front of me on a coffee table two years ago. I would have lasted about 30 minutes. Now, there is not a thing on this planet I want less. Just drop it. There's a rock that has the word Vicodin written on it somewhere in Southern California in the mountains. And it is the most pathetic, powerless rock on this planet right now. And this, guys, it is here for the taking. You have a storm to charge. You next October will thank you today. I'm telling you, man, you got to go for it. And Jesus will do what Jesus does best, the natural and the supernatural. Uncommon healing is available. And where God is trying to take you, he's going, that can't come with. That can't come with. We travel light where we're going. I'm starting to feel just like lighter and lighter and lighter. And then I pull out um, a shame. Because so much shame, that, has, that even came from like, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a leader who's battling this quiet addiction and has these imperfections. And welcome to the club for all of us, by the way. Shame is this feeling not of I'm doing something wrong, but rather I, I'm doing it wrong so many times that I am the thing that's wrong. And it is a lie from the pit of hell. And freedom from the sin that you're walking in is found in first and foremost freedom from the shame that you're feeling. You'd be surprised, man, once this gets lighter and this starts to get destroyed in your life, how much you actually want to not walk in the sin that you used to, how much you now want the good plans and the goodness of God. And you want nothing to take even a drop of that away from you. Shame is robbing you. And you must intellectually outsmart it. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You want to know what's crazy is this woman. She sneaks up from behind Jesus. Because she knows this is God. She's heard about Jesus. This is God. And I know there's power here. And if I could just touch the hem of his cloak, I'll be healed. So she had the faith, but she also had shame because she didn't want God to see her. And so she gets her healing, and then she runs and hides. And how many of us know God, but we're still running and hiding because we can't. We're so terrified to see what God's facial expression is towards us. I pastor people going through real stuff all the time, addiction, divorce, affairs. We all struggle with stuff, guys, and I have found even for so many Christians, the answer to this question, what does God's face look like towards you right now, will tell you everything you need to know about your relationship to God and what shame is doing to it. I have found for so many believers that God's face is one of disgust or I'm putting up with you now because maybe one day you'll figure this out. Or, again, the same chapter, like, really? When, in fact, the exact opposite is true. The exact opposite is true. In Exodus chapter 33, there's this amazing story of Moses who uh, is called up Mount Sinai to spend time with God on behalf of all the people he was leading. And on top of that mountain is where God gave him the Ten Commandments, and he comes down two weeks later and all the Israelites, they couldn't care 
less about the Ten Commandments until they saw the face of Moses because it was radiant and they had seen he was with the presence of God. And now it's like the world had, like, you have the world's attention, not because of the knowledge you know, but because they can tell you've been with God. And, um, you know, the story kind of goes, one of his experiences on top of the mountain, Moses makes the most audacious, bold, amazing request of God that has ever been made in all of history. He says, God, almost like speaking to a friend, he says, show me your glory. God's glory, essentially, I heard Judah Smith describe it this way, is God's godness. It's his essence. What makes God God? His glory. And God says, okay, you want to know my essence? I will show you my goodness. The first thing that comes to the mind of God when asked about his godness, not his wrath or his justice, but his goodness. He said, however, you can't fully see my face. He uses the word face a few times in Exodus 33. Because this is before Jesus, which means this is before the sin problem was completely dealt with. So God knows if you see all my glory, you will literally drop dead. Think Raiders of the Lost Ark and the melting faces. Moses, if you see my face, yours will melt. Like you can't handle it. So what I'll do is I will place you in the cleft of this rock. And I will allow my goodness and my glory to pass by. And as soon as I pass you, I will allow you to look and you will see my back. But that's all that you can do. This woman, years later, realizes this is God. And what does she do? Because she feels like she has to be sneaky because of shame. She sneaks up to Jesus' back, to God's back. And she reaches for the hem of that robe for healing. And she gets the healing that she believes in. And then Jesus all of a sudden stops, and she, because of shame, runs and hides. Once again, what is God's facial expression towards you? But that is when one of the most beautiful things in all of Scripture happens. Do you remember the three words I told you to remember at the beginning of this message? Jesus turned around so she could see his face. Healing from shame is found in the countenance or facial expression of your heavenly father who looks at you right now, not in disgust or confusion, not annoyed, not aggravated, but proud, so in love, not with the future version of you who has more of your stuff figured out, but with you right now. The scandalous nature of grace, what makes the gospel so illogical and insane is that Jesus was the incarnation, God with skin and bone on, who came to this planet to handle the sin problem once and for all, and he lived perfect without it. And then he died as a perfect sacrifice in order to give you his perfection, and now because of that, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. And he says the same thing to you that he said about Jesus as Jesus came up out of the Jordan River after being baptized. This is my son. The father's booming voice through the clouds. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And if you can believe it, today he's saying the same thing about you. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. The greatest challenge of being a Christian is trying to figure out how to believe news that good could be true for you. Because it is true, but you will experience it to the degree that you believe it. And healing is here, but you will walk in it to the degree that you go for it. Jesus turned around, walks up to this woman, and what does he say? Daughter. And try saying what he says next with a frown. Your faith has healed you. Now go and live the life of freedom that you've been searching for. Now go and live a little bit lighter. Now go and walk in the fullness of life and the good plans that I have for you. Daughter, son, your faith 
has healed you. Church, uncommon healing is available for those of us who want it. I am telling you, we are entering into a season as a church where there's just miracles for the taken. We're going to see miracles in this next season. We're going to see miracles as a church body. Even in our building situation, I believe that. We're going to see miracles in all of these chairs. There's a supernatural element that needs to happen in your story. Like, you got to go for the healing, and then the power of God has to do what it does. And I'm telling you, it's there for the taking for anybody who wants it. I found myself standing on the side of this mountain outside of San Diego feeling so much lighter. Because all four days, here's what's crazy about my time at this center. All four days, you're not allowed to talk about your job. You know how hard it is to get to know three strangers without being allowed to talk about what you do for a living? Especially when you're a pastor and you find your identity in it. And I talk about it all the time because it's not just a career to me, it's my calling. But now I'm not allowed to say any of that. And this guy, Glenn, um, mid-50s, man, just six foot two, like booming voice, just a guy's guy, just tough Probably hadn't cried in two decades, and I got to know him, and um, all, all four days, he was, like, trying to guess what I did, and he said, you're, like, in the music industry, aren't you? He said, you do something cool. I was like, no, but thank you, um, until the very last day at lunch, we're finally allowed to talk about it, and I said, Glenn, I think this is going to surprise you. Because all four days we got to know each other, and all he got to know was uh, broken Doug and um, addicted Doug. And uh, let's go for evening walks and cuss a lot, Doug. And not Pastor Doug, not wearing a cape, Doug. Not. And I said, hey, man, I'm, a, I'm actually a pastor. And he looked at me and started crying. And he, I, this is an exact quote. He said, bro, I would so go to your bleeping church, man. <laughs> I want that so bad as the testimonial on our front page for our website. I would so go to your bleeping church, man. He said, uh, my wife and I, for years, we went to this church where I just, I felt like a sinner in a room of saints. And the pastor, more than anybody else, made me feel that way. And he said, I just really needed you to be a pastor. And that's why today I'm like, I don't want to be a pastor and, and pray the human side comes across. I just want to be human and maybe let the pastor side come across. And I realized in that moment, God, you're not using me in spite of my brokenness. You are using me because of my brokenness. That's all this is, you guys. That's all this is. We're imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. You think that's just a good tagline we say? That is the reality of what this is. Imperfect people who God has perfected and is perfecting and healing, alive, living and breathing. A God who can do exponentially so much more than you could ever ask or imagine. And I kind of felt like in this moment today, this weekend, like Moses in, 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 some, in some ways, where on behalf of the group of people I'm leading, I climbed a mountain and spent time with God and came back down the message, the mountain with a message for you to tell you this is what God has in store for you and this is what God says about you and who you are to him because he told me. And I wanted to relay it to you as a messenger. And you know what? Four days in, a, in as one-on-one -on -one counseling is an, is an amazing gift and a great tool. But it's the presence of God that heals you. It's the power of Jesus that transforms your life. And that's available to you today. It's available to you as we worship. It's available to you all the time. And what's better then me going on your behalf to get a message and then relaying it to you is you hearing it from him himself. You have a mountain to climb. And the more that you do, and I promise you, he wants so bad to meet with you and say this to you face to face with the proud smile of a father who is absolutely in love. And the more that you start to realize that's true, the more healing you'll walk in, the more lightness you'll walk in, the more freedom will feel like freedom, and the more you'll close that chapter and really step into the life that is truly life. Amen? Will you guys stand? God, we love you.
and uh, we just worship you. I pray, um, God, you're the Ephesians 3.20. God, you can do more, so much more than all we could ever ask or imagine. And I believe, I feel it in my bones. For anybody in here, if you've been waiting, get ready. If you've been praying, get ready. If you've been hoping, get ready. Get ready for a miracle. We have a God of miracles who can do more, so much more than all we could ever ask or imagine. So as we worship him, stare into the proud face of a father absolutely in love and step into your uncommon healing. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Let's worship.